Hi everyone and welcome to another seamless retail and e-commerce webinar. I'm Micah, the conference manager of the event and on behalf of the team we would like to say thank you for joining us today. We will be kicking off with a topic improving customer engagement with technology. This session will be moderated by Ross McLean, group CEO of the Traffic Group and our panel of experts who will be sharing their knowledge with us are Frederick Bisberg, Chief Strategy and Business Acceleration Officer of North Takaful, Mustafa Ahmed, Chief of Design and Technology and Co-Owner of Lock and Stock, Navid Perzada, Chief Strategy Officer of Malta Global, and Anshul Srivasta, former CIO of Union Insurance Company. Before we proceed to the discussion, I'd like to remind all webinar attendees that you can ask questions throughout the panel sessions and our panelists will do their best to answer them. Now, can I please ask all the speakers to turn on the webcam and microphone? And yeah, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Ross. Great. Thank you, Micah, and good morning, everyone. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on this morning's webinar. And our thanks to uh, our friends at uh, Seamless and Terrapin for putting this on. So today we are living in an age where the primary source of uh, contact that businesses and individuals are having with each other is, is this, it's through the screen, it's through thumbs, it's through fingertips, and it's through eyeballs. Uh, so today offers an opportunity for us to really discuss with our panelists uh, this in some more detail and for you to take the opportunity to raise any questions that you may have yourselves. So today's topic of conversation is improving customer engagement with technology. We're fortunate enough to have with us a number of our esteemed colleagues that Micah has kindly introduced to you. So we're going to run through a few questions today. Please feel free to add questions yourself into the question bar on the right hand side as as we go through and we will endeavor to cover those off with you. So Frederick, if you don't mind, I'll start with your good self. Um, what are you doing at Neurotakaful during these times to engage more effectively with your customers? Yeah, thank you and, and good morning everybody. Um, now we have been an insurance company which means that we don't have that many people just calling to chat. Uh, people are basically just calling us when they have a, when they have a problem. Uh, so, so what we've done is to make sure that our internal our internal communications are much more seamless. So we have uh, spent quite a lot of time trying to to make our data more connected, to make sure that the call center have um, access to even more data about our customers, to make sure that the, the frontline workers they have um, our salespeople they have all information needed. So we don't rely on on the the typical. Uh, talk during the hallways that we normally did just to, to give an update. So we've, we've digitized the interaction more than, uh, than we did before. I also think uh, one of the things we've done is we've engaged our call center actually, uh, which is not very digital, but we've engaged our call center in calling out to our customers just to make sure that they're okay as, as a service to make sure that how they're doing. Uh, that, that's that's the, the major things. I think the, the major thing is that what we've done is, is try to make the communications internally as seamless as possible so everybody has very, very easy access to, to the knowledge about what's going on with our partners and customers on, on the digital platform. So we don't rely too much of the, on the interaction that we had before in the office. And are you finding, Frederick, that there are some technologies being more effective than others during this, during this time? WhatsApp, of course. WhatsApp is, uh, is booming for us. It's, it's, um, I think our call center now is, is at a point where they have more WhatsApp conversations that they have phone, phone calls. So that's really taking off. It's, it's super convenient and, and easy for everybody to, to send pictures, to ask questions. So I think that's, that's the technology that we are, we've seen the, the, the greatest growth in. Okay, great. And Mustafa, if you don't mind, I'll go to your good self. Um, Lock, lock and stock for our participants who are not aware, you know, you guys offer a tremendous platform that offers rewards and offers to the student population in particular. Um, I suspect that this current crisis has forced students of all ages to be learning remotely in a way that yeah. perhaps hasn't been the case previously. Um, what are you guys finding as your biggest uh, change in behavior at the moment and how are you responding to that? 
So, so Russ, uh, what we've noticed is that, or what we've sort of expected is that uh, our offer redemptions are something that was definitely going to decline, right? Because we primarily partner with about more than 300 different brands here in the UAE. Um, so to combat that, we've now partnered with a bunch of different brands across the globe because now Lock and Stock has become a global application to provide online offers. So we've seen while that one line is going down, the second one is skyrocketing up, which is sort of making up for that gap. So that was one aspect of it from, a, from an offering standpoint that we've adjusted and course corrected. Another thing was that, so from the, from the start of Lock and Stock, we've always sort of uh, described ourselves as an application that you use to lock your phones in class. So as of Jan, uh, as of, uh, sorry, March of this year, uh, ever since the lockdown happened, we, we've sort of opened the floodgates to, making, uh, to allowing students to lock their phones from home. Uh, couple that with a timetable feature means that kids are now setting up class yeah. timetables on their uh, phones and are then being able to also lock from home and collect points and you know rank against uh, the you know, students in that leaderboard. So that's kind of what we've uh, done to sort of combat that. So I think uh, you're on mute. And are you, fi are you finding, Mustafa, during this time that kids are being, uh, they're being good? Um, in sticking to keeping the phones locked down, or is this current circumstance posing big challenges for their uh, concentration levels? Let's say. Yeah. So, so it was. Um, it's definitely a, a mixed bag of kids uh, that we have. That you know, some who are just glued to their phones because it's your phone is your only friend at this point, since you're sitting at home. Uh, while uh, others are, you know, religiously locking their phones and you know, uh, trying to stay focused in class. So, so some of the things that we've done is that we've tried to really gamify that experience. Um, so our leaderboard, which used to just be a board where you can see how you rank, now has a $100 voucher as a, as a first place price to scoring the highest number of minutes uh, that you put on the board. So you have kids from you know, dozens of schools and universities all competing every week trying to get that first place. And that's really started to you know, build momentum and, uh, and push this behavior of... Uh, digital detox and well-being that we've been trying to you know uh, in, uh, bring about since since September of 2017. Marvelous, marvelous and we'll maybe come back to uh, to this uh, a little bit later but that's great thank you Mustafa. Thank you. Naveed if you don't mind moving over to yourself um, you know with traditional malls being closed down or indeed being forced to comply with much stricter measures during the, the current crisis uh, are you finding that customers have retained their love and their desire for retail? Um, and how have you seen their behaviors adapt and change? Well, I would say that uh, if there is anything that uh, the situation, the current pandemic has done around us, is it has slightly accelerated the obvious route of everything. I mean, like what Frederick mentioned uh, in terms of uh, customers interacting with a brand or a service, moving more towards chat, WhatsApp, bots, so on and so forth. Uh, the distant learning, which has, uh, should I say, sort of accentuated what Lock and Stock has been doing so nicely for the past many years. E-commerce uh, was uh, taking retail head on even before this. Uh, people were feeling very, very comfortable with the idea of shopping from home, be it by... Uh, should I say value of uh, the value itself or whether it is convenience, the, it was happening. Now, since due to the current restrictions across several countries, since it has moved towards necessity, uh, the one around technology, as I sometimes refer to it. So for instance, the fad of AR or VR has sort of simmered down a little and it has converted into necessity. So consumer behaviors, have developed or should I say changed as far as product categories are concerned. So you will find customers engaging, should I say, relatively less with luxury categories. And I would guess about that brand of watch, perhaps a watch because it can still be seen in the screen, but if you don't even know if I'm wearing shoes right now, do you? So uh, I am. So, <laughs> uh, so customer preferences towards certain category of products may have changed. Uh, but other than that, if anything, uh, I mean, I just read this morning. I don't exactly remember the source of the statistic, but it was an email that was claiming that engagement has gone up as much as 60 percent 
since uh, the several, uh, different uh, countries have imposed uh, lockdowns, should I say restrictions. So yeah, that is where it is right now. You're on mute. And are you, are you finding, Naveed, um, that during this time, um, some of the new customer-focused technologies are, are able to create more immersive or more authentic retail experiences? Sure. Um, just to give you a quick, like, 30-second background, I, I hate to talk about my own product or brand during these things. Uh, I mean, Malda Global, uh, due to the kind of situation we were due for the Malda Global. Outlet Malda is our traditional uh, retail first value, uh, best of it, uh, as most uh, customers are looking out for. Malda Global was supposed to, is supposed to be our completely experiential platform which uh, we uh, refer, refer to as uh, the most immersive and the, uh, the next best thing from actually being in the mall. It uh, combines technologies like AR, VR, and uh, should I say a lot of uh, machine learning and aided affairs to give the customer the most customized and holistic and immersive experience around it. Um, we were due for uh, launching uh, Malda Global by October in sync with the the now, uh, uh, should I say, slightly uh, rescheduled Expo 2020. But we are sort of preponing that a little bit because now uh, the immersion that we were looking into bring across as an experience, we feel has become a downright necessity. Uh, if you are not there on the ground, uh, the next best thing is any level or degree of immersion uh, that a product or a brand can offer you, sure, you will go out and buy that pair of jeans, even if you take a look at a nicely shot photograph. But if you get a chance to interact with a brand in an immersive environment, be it through a VR immersion, a mixed reality or a hyper reality immersion, uh, it just adds on to the value. So going back to my first response, things that were considered to be uh, should I say, uh, I'm sorry for using the term, gimmicky, some years back, some months back, are now starting to become an absolute necessity. If I can just have like 30 seconds on more on, it's a, it's a very interesting story. About, uh, it's about uh, 18 to 24 months back, uh, the very fine organization and a gentleman from Italy, uh, he got in touch with us and saying that he had a very fine technology whereby he is creating these uh, immersive VR environments. The beauty of those VR environments, uh, the pro was that they were very quick to develop, very quick to customize. It was almost like a drag and drop, like in Minecraft or Sims. slightly better graphics, but sure, something similar to that. Uh, the cons of that is the graphical quality was not exactly as advanced as what we are used to. Their entire pitch was that they wanted this tool to be available for people to be able to create their own virtual expos. Now, 18 months back, even for uh, someone uh, from an organization and a school of thought, we believe in immersive technologies more than the next person. This seemed like a very far-fetched thought. And I'm being honest with you. If you repeat that same pitch to us today, I mean, all of us, it suddenly starts sounding uh, relatively more valuable, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. I think, you know, we're very much seeing this acceleration of needs given that everyone is sitting behind screens and not coming out onto the roads just now. Um, in fact, that leads me on very nicely, Naveed. Thank you for that. Um, we have Anne Scholl on with us as well, who's spent a long time also, like Frederick, working in the insurance industry. Um, Anne Scholl, I'm keen to get your, your views on um, how you believe the industry is addressing customer concerns during this period of time. You know, it's an industry where uh, it's facing some very um, different macroeconomic um, behaviors at the moment. People are driving less. They are spending much more time at home. They are more concerned naturally about their health. Um, has this changed the dynamic and the shape of the products that the insurers are providing to their customers? Uh yeah, I mean, uh, definitely there is uh, a, a, the insurance industry, industry as an industry uh, booms when there is a crisis. 
So in the time of crisis, like this kind of pandemics, the, the insurance, uh, other than maybe like uh, the motor insurance you talked about, the people are driving less, uh, people are more, more not moving. On the other side, people are more concerned about their lives and health. So there is a big spike in life insurance and health insurance and home insurance as well, like fires happening across and people are protecting themselves against fire. But life insurance has seen a massive, massive um, jump in the business. So, I mean, uh, on, the, on that side of it, uh, and uh, the penetration of life insurance, we see insurance is a kind of a subject which is till now uh, sold, not bought. And that's where the customer engagement becomes more important. Insurance has always been sold, not bought. You will never find a person going in uh, the shopping uh, setup, e-com or uh, online to go and buy insurance unless it's a mandatory insurance like health and uh, motor, which is a mandatory insurance by law in every country. So almost health is almost in every country and motor is definitely every country. So uh, the, the engagement part uh, becomes all the more relevant and profound when you start pushing in products on the health health benefits and life. Now you'll see a massive spike of people trying to protect themselves by buying life insurance so that their families are not affected basis which the pandemic is going on and somebody getting infected. So the protection on the different scales starts happening. And now a more kind of a data churning and data monitoring is required in terms of the behavior the people go and shop and buy or service themselves on insurance. So that's where the the channels, uh, the, especially the digital channels come, come in picture and support you to uh, go and buy. So there are, uh, there are different behavior patterns you may see, but insurance during the time of crisis is an industry which sees, which, which actually uh, has, uh, goes through some kind of spikes in various products. Well, that's great. I mean, I can lead me back nicely, Frederick, to your good self. Um, because as we emerge from this crisis and the world tries to return to some semblance of normality, I suppose my question is, you know, what behaviours do we believe have changed for good? And what technology do you see progressing the fastest to support greater levels of, of customer engagement? If, I, if we look at the insurance industry as an example, if people are sat at home for three months not using their motor vehicle and there's technology to determine how much people are traveling during the course of a year, do you think that there will be a much greater need and response for people to be getting insurance, you know, paper use as an example? Um, in, in the health sector, do you think we're seeing fundamental changes with how people are buying? I also know that you guys have spent a lot of time with data to understand and have predictive analysis on, on segments of who is more or less at risk. Um, I'd be interested to get your views around that and how that is, is fundamentally addressing the insurance industry. I think, uh, I think, fantastic question, by the way. Uh, I, I think we have to take a step back and just acknowledge that uh, literally overnight, the whole world became what I call virtually competent because now we, we don't mind having discussions meeting like this anymore. Uh, so so the, our mindset towards virtual meetings, our mindset towards meetings and, and shopping has changed significantly, right? I mean, I believe all of us are now using online services and, and the ones who didn't do it before, they're also doing it. And there's nothing that, that tells me that that will go back to what it was before. Also to to, to continue on, uh, on what, what you just said was that insurance is, is not something that people actually wake up in the morning and say, hey, I'm going to go shop insurance. So the, the convenience factor is also playing in a lot here. So I, I, don't, I think the, the branch network of insurance companies is going to see an extreme drop in, in visitors. And that, that puts, a, put a, puts a pressure to the insurance insurance companies digital delivery channels because all of a sudden customers they expect everything to be digital from the claims to the to the purchase i mean the whole process basically so so of course as an insurance company but basically for for all companies we or they have to prepare be able to 
accommodate that. Uh, one of the things is, of course, making sure that, as we talked about earlier, also the data is in one place. So when customers, they, they write in or WhatsApp in or whatever they do, you actually know what customer you're, you're dealing with and you don't have to go through this process. Give me your Invasi ID, give me this and this, as, as we used to from the branches. I, I also think, and, and this is a little side note, but I get back to the question about, um, about pay as you go. But, but I also think one of the considerations that, that we have to, to make which we discussed just before we uh, we went live here is when <clears throat> when when we are going virtual, and this is a more general observation in terms of customer care. When we are going virtual, it's very easy for companies to dare I say hide behind technology, hide behind the email, the WhatsApps, and everything. And and for, it's much faster, of course. But we 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 risk forgetting the importance of seeing human faces. Uh, and and if, if our customers are not able to, to connect a human face to our brand at some point, then we will be just a, a logo, right? And I think one of the things uh, insurance companies, but, but also other companies have to consider is how, how, do, we, how do we re-establish some kind of, of, of face-to-face contact? Do we have to have virtual meetings like this with our customers, just you know, as, as a regular checkup, how satisfied are they with, with being customers? Or how do we how do we keep this so so at least there is some kind of, of face to the brand as well? I think that's an extremely important consideration. Um, back to your question about uh, usage-based uh, insurance, the the world is going that way, right? We we are we are getting used to everything as a service and only when we need it for how long as we need it and and subscriptions. Uh, so. That, that is coming to insurance as well, especially now where, where all of us have cars sitting in the garages for three months. We're starting to think about, do we even need the car? <laughs> do we need the car insurance where we're not driving it? So that, that, that was a development that was in the making, but now it's most probably been accelerated. Uh, I mean, the usage-based insurance, at least for, for cars, uh, has been for 10 years, 15 years, or even 30 years with some claim. But it never really, uh, it hasn't taken off yet. I think the, the insurers who are, who are capable of launching something that, that resonates with the customers, they, they will probably have a, a strategic advantage going forward because we will be much more used to this as a, as a service or subscription-based products. So, so yeah, that, that's, that's the way the, the world is permanently changing. I, I don't, I'm a very strong advocate for what I call the new normal. Uh, and, and I'm really trying to, to talk to everybody who wants to listen to me that, we won't go back to what it was before. When, when the pandemic is over, we, we risk to see another wave of, of the, the virus breaking out. We, we will for sure see a very, very deep recession uh, and an enormous amount of unemployment. So how, how do we relate to that? Uh, so, and then these are, these are the things that, that will affect everything that, that we're doing, including in insurance companies. That was a long answer to a short question. No, that's, no, that's the purpose of today is to have a great conversation. So no, that's, uh, that's great. You've raised a couple of things that we can maybe come back to at the end around broader customer trends that would be useful for us to look at. Um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll move Mustafa to, to yourself because I think this, this also leads in when Frederick talks about systemic change. You know, we've seen the landscape of online learning and student engagement being fundamentally altered now. Yeah. Kids are, are, are learning from home. There are parents who have given up jobs to support their children during this time as well. Um, my question is maybe a broader one for you as, with, with no offense to uh, the rest of us panelists on here, but as our youngest panelist on here, um, you know, how do you see the youth of today, Mustafa, Gen Z per se, um, you know, how are they going to continue to evolve how they interact, use and develop technology? Um, and do you think that this is an inflection point that is making people more engaged or more distant? Right. So, so what we've noticed is that uh, when, when it comes to people, you know, deciding on their education and well, what, what that sort of thought process is going like, um, a lot, a lot of people uh, have uh, feel that they don't want to put their life on hold, right? Just because there's a pandemic, they do still want to go ahead and study. They still want to, you know, pursue their education. But now, because you have some of the more you know, what we like to call the big four in education, that in terms of location, that is the U.S., Canada, Australia, and the U.K. as you know, prime destinations to go and study. While people are 
unable to sort of make the journey there now due to Corona, at least in the time uh, in the during this period. Um, everybody is then now opting to more domestic um, offerings, right? And what what we've uh, noticed is, and so for us as Lock and Stock, so when we started this, uh, we are essentially from a purely business model perspective, we're an educational consultancy, right? But our front to the users is an office platform, a productivity tool, a job platform, and not, you know, it's this three-in-one sort of a platform with scholarships <laughs> being a, a fourth component to it. And we, we've realized that uh, while people are, this, this, it's, you know, while the pandemic has sort of altered and affected this, uh, the, the, the Gen Z in terms of, because now they're in you know, the, these, these four years of their lives, moving, going into college will probably be a defining point in their life as to where, where they go uh, moving forward as, you know, into what stream, into what industry, where, depending on which industry gets a hit and, you know, what, what they do for the rest of their lives. Um, we can see now that a lot of them don't are, you know, they're, they're, they're very um, confident. They're, they're fighters. They want to go still proceed, uh, you know, uh, go ahead and pursue their education. It doesn't, it does, uh, to majority of them, it doesn't matter where they study. They feel that, you know, you get a batch, uh, you know, a BBA course done in Australia won't be that different from a BBA course done in an Australian university in another country, right? Um, and as a result, so, so fortunately for us, right, so this year we expanded our scholarships offering. So we, uh, we ended uh, 2019 with 20 universities here in the UAE. We, we, we ended uh, um, February of 2020 with 600 universities globally. So we spent, you know, a good chunk of time uh, closing those deals. Obviously, those have been affected. However, our domestic offering here in the UAE itself is our strongest. So we've noticed a lot of, because as you know, uh, so, since you've been in the education space, you know that about 60, 70% of students uh, tend to go abroad to study. Majority of those guys want to now still study here domestically. So that means a lot of that is funneling through us um, since we have about 45,000 students on the platform. Uh, and uh, what we've realized is that this is now sort of, uh, the effect is sort of ex uh, stretching out to other neighboring countries as well. Where if you're staying in Oman and you don't have an offering, good, good enough offering in Oman, the, the, the furthest you'll stretch is to come here to the UAE to study and pursue your high, higher education. Right? So that's the kind of behavior that we've started to see that's, and that's been developing where uh, you know, students will, will, they understand that okay, they, they have to go through online uh, courses. Many of them have you know, sort of fought back against it saying that, no, why, why should I be paying the same price for it? This is where then universities have started to adapt and evolve to that as well to sort of accommodate for those uh, settings. Uh, and essentially, and going back to Frederick's point, uh, Frederick's point that the world isn't gonna be the same after this. Right? It's, it's definitely changing. The definitely things that we we're seeing here in the education space itself that is gonna be sticking as, as the new normal uh, or, you know, which previously frowned upon as, you know, an online course doesn't count, get a, get a re real, you know, certification from a real university. Uh, that is now slowly shifting, and uh, you know we we, we use lock and soccer just sort of uh, working with universities and students to sort of bring everybody together, uh, and, you know, and uh, assist uh, and help out as many kids as we can, you know, to get to so that they don't have to miss out on their you know uh, education and put that on hold, because ultimately it trickles down, right? The the, the longer I wait to do, pursue my education, the longer I wait to get a get a you know a, a well paid job. The longer I, my family has to wait for me to sort of bring bring in a, a solid income to support. So it just it's a domino effect, um, and what we've noticed is that kids have started you know pick up on that. So, yeah. Brilliant. That's uh, that's excellent, and as I say, we'll we'll maybe have another look into the the, the broader customer trends around this. Navid, if I can go back to yourself, um, please. Um, as you say, um, you know, traditional malls and physical retailers um, have been really challenged during this time period um, to find more interactive ways of of engaging consumers outside the mall. I mean, I think for those of us based in the UAE, we've seen our friends at Majid Al Fatim opening up drive-in cinemas, uh, you know, underneath uh, Ski Dubai, which has been a great innovation from what's there. I um, suppose the question would be, you know, has this fundamentally changed the business model of retail? And, you know, what technology has proven to be the winner kind of coming out of this crisis? 
the business model of retail has been in the process of changing uh, for a very, very long time. Uh, for the past few years, as many as, uh, as little as three, I would say, uh, even the most traditional business models have started looking at uh, online channels. You will still find some brands that uh, electively choose, actually did electively choose not to sell online the likes of some very, very high-end designer labels because they thought that the entire retail experience of coming inside a store and making a purchase uh, justified the value of a $7,000 wallet uh, for what it's worth. Um, so other than that, every brand, uh, irrespective of category, has managed to find its space within the uh, online retail uh, universe in some way or the other. Now, as uh, Mustafa uh, rightly mentioned that what was previously happening and how it is evolving previously, uh, people were quite, should I say, it was frowned upon to do, get an online degree. And now it seems like the most obvious choice. What the times have done at this point has accelerated us in the direction. Now, what strategies on ground operators are taking? How exactly it is going to pan out? I mean, again, uh, yes, I absolutely and unconditionally agree with uh, Frederick and Mustafa. Uh, this is the new normal. I think human beings, the best ability uh, that the creator gave all of us was the ability to adapt. And the second more valuable one was the ability to forget of how it used to be. And suddenly we are in the new zone and somehow we have the ability to just get into that action. So we used to talk about in marketing, uh, like Frederick was saying, having that human angle. Yes, definitely. Brand needs to have face and personalities and personas. Uh, but again, there used to be that term we used to say that the human touch, the human touch used to be the life of a brand and now it's apparently. So uh, yes, things are changing. Uh, they have, and this is the new normal. The strategies that brands will need to take is that uh, malls have to be open with limited timings, with a lot of restrictions. I personally happen to have a retail operation as well, so I'm familiar with what malls and specifically Mr. Majid, I mean, the people at Majid al are doing. So you have restrictions about fitting rooms, you have restrictions about trying on apparel, you have restrictions about several things. So retail, uh, particularly in this part of the world and in most part of the world, is going to remain, but as we uh, with the digital space have been saying, uh, that on-ground brick and mortar retail is going to take more of a role of a uh, demo shop or should I say an experience zone rather than a transaction zone per se. Uh, yes, uh, the uh, drive-in cinema, it was quite innovative uh, that uh, they decided to open it up on the rooftop. Apparently it's not opening up now. I'm quite sad about it. I was about to make bookings. I just saw the news that they're probably delaying it for a little while for, uh, for several reasons. Uh, but the idea is that earlier, the channels that used to be supplementary and complementary to the greater mix of a company's bottom line are going to become priority. Uh, case in point, once again, out of uh, personal experience, uh, uh, for f and for the f and business, uh, the deliveries used to be a, depending on the kind of F&B business you're in, if you're a pizza delivery service, obviously that is your mainstay. But for a typical restaurant or food outlet, deliveries used to be a supplementary margin that used to range between a very higher and some, somewhere around the tune of 30% of the total till value by the end of the day. That figure has completely been reversed. Now, 70% of your till value is uh, fed in by deliveries as opposed to 30% uh, through uh, dine-in or takeaway or any other mode of that matter. So companies will need to accelerate uh, towards the digital space. Um, they will need to find modes, models, and channels uh, which are more uh, suitable for their brand in question. It's not every, see, the re, I mean, the main concern behind marketplaces, sorry, I'm just going to elongate it, is for organizations because it's very expensive to maintain a single brand outlet. Just the sheer value of customer acquisition may not justify into one, two, or even three transactions that a person makes across over there. So being across in a marketplace, 
uh, and uh, being only subject to uh, spends if you sell is always a better option for brands. Other than that, product selection, uh, should I say uh, product development, or whatever it is that people are producing is going to become a little more critical. Mother, once again, we are talking about uh, insurance over here. The products are going to evolve a little. Uh, sure, uh, when uh, one aspect of something goes down, there is some always a silver lining or something uh, else is going to come up within that same product mix. But no, uh, organizations will obviously need to look more actively uh, towards their sales channels, optimize them a little more. Uh, uh, should I say, uh, and marketplaces will need to be ready to uh, welcome and accommodate that degree of traffic and value, which brings everything into the play, whether it is the baseline technological infrastructure or whether it is the transaction processing part of it, whether it is the logistical arm of it needs to supplement uh, and you know do the last mile delivery. So that's what uh, people will essentially need to look at. That's great. Thank you, uh, Navid. Thank you. Um, if I can ask Anshul, um, just on the back of that, we, we spoke and Frederick touched earlier on, um, you know, some of the data coming out of this crisis, changing the way that, that insurers view the world. Um, we, I mean, do you do you think that we now run the risk with having the, the market insight that we have? Do you think that the insurance industry runs the risk of perhaps being much more selective and less inclusive to uh, people who are, are seeking for cover? Because the data is so much more rich in being able to predict who, who is at risk and who is not. Is that um, perhaps one of the challenges or pitfalls that needs to be navigated by the industry coming out from this? Okay, uh, uh, definitely uh, the, uh, the data is a big, big problem. And uh, the way the data has been collected or uh, procured or uh, established, uh, it's, it, it's always in a very unstructured, semi-structured way. Now, I'm not just going to talk about insurance industry as an industry across industry industries um, i believe barring the essentials the world will actually going to take a reshape i mean now it's go data will see its own relevance because the world is uh, actually moving towards uh, transforming towards taking up the channels which were like the most uh, unpreferred channels like digital channels and the traditional players were not pushing hard to get those uh, channels adopted because there were kind of biases, there were kind of traditional methods of doing business. So that's why the digital channels were ignored. Now, topping to that, my, mark my words, mark my words, barring the essentials. Now, everything which would get created would be created on a basis of data. Everything. I mean, if you are selling through digital channels, you would not sell traditional products, barring the essentials. Barring the essentials, you will not sell traditional products and services. You will touch upon things like on-demand. Now, on-demand has become a need of the hour. I mean, you will see a massive dip in automobile sales. People will not buy cars because they, like, like someone said in the panel, that. For three months, I have not used my car. Why? Why should I pay insurance and why should I keep the car and uh, without without and without any usage? So I will go and go go for paper mile insurance or paper paper step health insurance, which I did in my union days. Paper paper walk insurance, paper kilometer insurance. I walk so um, and that's going to be a health insurance and life insurance. I mean, considering I have all the variables to capture my heartbeats, to capture my uh, blood, uh, uh, heart conditions, may, blood pressures, and maybe in future blood sugar as well. So it will predict my health and I can, I can pay per my number of steps I take or per, per kilometer I walk, I pay for my health or life insurance. So, I mean, today you've been sold uh, insurance for a year, which you might not use it. Or if you use it, you use it only uh, when there is, uh, there's, a, there's a point of claim. So risk would see a massive shift. 
and risk assessment should have to be seen as a there's nothing called mortality as such in insurance business for any more i mean uh, now you are categorizing because of this covid pandemic that older people are dying more than the younger lot but it's it's not everywhere it's it's a different story uh, in every part of the world it's basis the way you've captured your health in, health data and made made sure that your health data gives out some really really insightful insights to actually take your data and predict that data so i mean yeah i mean risk management from all business perspective will completely depend i mean whether it's insurance whether it's banking whether it's retail whether it's education i mean nobody predicted this risk and if that would have been a situation everybody would have been ready with their risk management approaches and run the business Uh, would have taken a different meaning, uh, or the governments were ready to uh, take care of uh, governments across the world should have had the disaster recovery and plan B for that, but not not anymore. Now data will see more relevance. Data will get more profound, more legitimate, more valuable. Yeah, that 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 is true. Uh, but I think it's also um, it could also be interesting to 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 take the discussion maybe a level up. Because, as you were saying, which is completely correct, now we can basically get data from everything. We have data lakes. We have social media, uh, social media listening tools. We we have everything. So so, the amount of data that is available to us is is insane, right? Uh, well, one of the things that I think, but that, that's not only insurance, but insurance is just an easy example, right? But um, how 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 do we actually want to use these data, and and where, where do we where do we step into the to the privacy of the people? Because theoretically, if any, if any of you wanted to to get insurance from us, then we could we could browse your Facebook, your LinkedIn, your your profile, your online profile to see what kind of life that you portray, the portray that you lead, and based on that, we would actually be able to to price the insurance that you're asking for. Now, coupling that with with all other informations that we have, and this is, I believe, Ross, one of your one of your questions, right, which which is a bit more insurance specific, is that If you go that direction, if you use all available data, then at some point in time, as as an insurance company, then you'd be able to only select the customers who is close to being guaranteed having no claims. And if you take that to a to a further extreme, then everybody who has a chance to have a claim statistically will not be able to buy insurance. So so you're simply excluding a lot of people from buying insurance because the statistics say, yeah, no, sorry, you'll have a claim, so we won't insure you. And and of course that's that's an ethical discussion, and I think I want to stop it here because it is an ethical discussion. But I wanted to to highlight it because it, it should be taken down to how we use data in general, not only insurance. Because if if somebody in in your customer database is changing the the status on Facebook to engaged, for example, should we send emails offering you know wedding packages? And what do I know? And, and so, so where, where is that extended? Some some people they would say, "Hey, this is so cool, I need it." And other people they would feel you are really invading their privacy. So how do we how do we deal with that? Because there is so much public information available, right? So I think it's, it's a relevant discussion. So Frederick, so, I jump in with a bit, a bit of a uh, humor note that if anybody is posting that they're engaged on Facebook, privacy is the least of their issues. So sorry about that. <laughs> sorry, Andrew. <laughs> I'll break that into two pieces wherein you said that uh, when people are not healthy and they should not be given uh, health insurance or something, I, or rather people who have bad credit history should not be given loans. I mean, they, they, that's where your smartness needs to come in to devise products which are meant for them. I mean, to correct and fix them. I mean, uh, you can't always uh, uh, have bad people also not being inclusive. They can be inclusive. I mean, there is an AIDS insurance which is being sold. There is a cancer insurance also being sold, globally. So it's a, and the, so 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 you need to do your risk management the basis the data you have. No, I mean, you see, so it's not that bad credit customers would not get loans. They will get loans, uh, maybe from non from non traditional markets, or or I mean, they they do get they get at eighteen, twenty, thirty percent. Loans. Yeah, but that, that is the point, right? And that, that is exactly the point. And the, the loans is a very good example because the, the the banks they've stopped giving loans to people with bad credit, right? And and they go to to the black markets. So so 
which which is uncontrolled. So that is a bigger market, and that's a bigger market. Yeah, yeah, it, it is, but is that is that what you want as a company, or not as a company, as, as a country, right? Would you really want to to um, uh, as you call it, promote the growth of of, uh, of black markets? I, I'm, 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 so I'm, I agree with you 100. percent I'm not talking about the, the, the risk of it. I'm talking about the ethics of of where where would you set the the the, the line on on what data we use and not use, because. If if we as insurers we we are we are told to maximize our profits, right? So so we would we would gravitate towards only taking the, the what we call the good risks, the ones with, with the best chance of paying. But the rest of the people still need insurance. So so would we as an insurance industry, and, and this goes for all industries basically, would we prefer to promote the, the growth of a black market or would we find a, a way within our own industry to 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 solve this issue? I, I just, and of course, I don't have the answer. I'm, I'm just asking questions, right? Uh, but, but I think it's, it's questions that, that can I, can our industry and other industries have to have to consider. So, so I believe the data is now going to be more profound. I'm taking an example of Mustafa in the education sector. People who are academically weak, students are not academically weak. Maybe professionals, they are very strong and they get... Mm -hmm. They don't get admissions in various colleges because they are... Now we have to pull out data to build, build a kind of a skill-based learning. Now, the jobs are... Yeah. Not be degree-based jobs. It's going to be skill-based jobs. No, absolutely. I mean, I think there are universities out there that are now sort of restructuring the way uh, they accept uh, people in, right? I mean, uh, you have certain universities here itself in the UAE that are very academically focused. But then you have also some Ivy League universities in the states that look at you as an overall structure, you know, and not just academics. But what what are the other things that you've done, in, you know, in your high school years? Uh, and that's what they take into account to, you know, uh, see whether you are a right fit for that university or not. So I 100% I agree with you that I, I, I personally feel uh, that academics is slowly withering away. Um, ex unless for, you know, really specific roles where academics play, play a very high uh, value. Uh, but to join any major, uh, uh, you know, company, at least any major Fortune 500 company these days that they look at both academics and you know your personality your skills the your 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 volunteering your projects you've worked on your initiatives that you've taken up the whole package uh and you know um schools have also started to take notice of that and they're they you know they've incorporated programs to sort of support uh students um but see at the end of the day it really just boils down to you as an individual right um, if you are not, uh, if if you if you are in an environment where majority of the uh, where the majority environment or the or the or the job landscape looks at academics as a priority, but you have not gone the mile of, uh, you know, uh, building up and picking up on all these different skills, then you know you 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 as a student can't sit there and complain and you know blame the world for not you know not being this this new world that you you hope for it to be if you've not done this taking the steps yourself, right? Mm. Um, so, so that's kind of what we've seen. So Mustafa, you raise a good point and just given our last six or seven minutes before we open up to the attendees for any further questions, I, I did have on the back of that a question for all of you as our panelists because uh, you know we are seeing some very uh, divergent customer trends at the moment. The world has been traveling in the direction of um, car usage coming down, carpooling going up we hit a pandemic and car usage is going to start going up again because it's okay. the same way for people to travel public transport is going to come down the gig economy of uber of airbnb that sharing economy is being fundamentally challenged um, because of the nature of it and the safety of it and what we're seeing is established technologies established ways of uh, engaging with customers have proven to be the most successful video conferencing e-commerce text messaging whatsapp that frederick mentioned earlier uh, one of the guys um from our team the other day said 2013 called and wants its dictionary back <laughs> so i suppose my question is when we talk about improving customer engagement with technology it feels like it some of the more established technologies that are actually responding more democratically to the needs of the world at the moment, rather than the things at the, at the high cutting edge. But speaking mm. to you today, it feels also that um, leaving this post-COVID world, there are some fundamental shifts in behavior 
um, that we are going to be witnessing. So I was keen to understand from each of you as a wrap up, what are your predictions for a post COVID world around the biggest change in customer behavior? And how do you see that affecting either the industries that you work in or humanity more broadly? Navid, maybe we can start with yourself. Sure. Uh, Post-COVID world, wow, interesting. Um, so, so, I mean, for, first, first of all, it's, it is going to be a, a seamless, pun intended, make a transition uh, from where we were, where we are, and where we are going to end up. Uh, yes, uh, even something as massive as COVID-19, which took the entire world shock. Um, but uh, like I said, we as human beings very soon to adapt are sitting over here and trying to have the same conversation we would have had on a stage as of, uh, I mean, up until 2019. I remember it until then. And uh, so the technologies which are going to prevail and the things that people are going to adapt onto, my personal and our organizational technology has always been uh, no matter what it is that you're building, no matter what it is that you're doing, no matter what it is that you're looking into craft or produce, the first question that you need to ask yourself is, is it addressing a problem statement? If it is addressing a problem statement, good. Then you need to ask yourself the question, so what? At every single step, I am going to build a tool which is going to get people to, children to lock their phones while they're studying, so what? Uh, because by this way, we will uh, have a certain degree of assurance that they are not distracted while they're doing that. So what and so what and so what. Same goes for our business and every other business around it. The problem statement has changed. The point of this entire thing is the one technology that we were all uh, harping about and like my heart goes out to them for the biggest uh, technological uh, financial deals in this region, 3.1 uh, billion and change of dollars. Uh, between Kareem and Uber, and you rightfully mentioned it right now, that that is the one business that by virtue of its nature and the associated security concerns, or sorry, safety and health concerns that people have, is, is uh, affecting it uh, in one way or another. The problem state has changed. There are some technologies which uh, not by virtue of uh, futuristic, in, but just by, uh, I would say, coincidence, uh, comply to what, what is happening right now. Technologies like video conferencing, technologies like uh, chatbots and chat, and interacting with customers without having a face over there. E-commerce had come into play uh, as a tool for uh, convenience. Uh, virtue of its scalability model, it started offering value, and that is where it was dependent upon. Now, e-commerce is going up the baton of adding experience to it. Now experience, a lot of platforms have been talking about it, have been addressing it in their own way. Now the gimmickry will need to step out and the functionality and addressing of those problem statements will need to come in. For instance, I also think, I also think I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt because no, no, I, I think that there, there's no disagreement that uh, virtual and IT and tech will advance and, and everything will become more digital. I think again, and, and I, I, I don't know if it is my day of stepping back today, but I, I still, if you look at the consumers, let, let's try to see what we expect happen to the consumers, right? So what is the problem? The problem is we are in a huge recession. The problem is that there is so many people who are unable to, 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 um, to give food to their families. The problem is that there is uh, unemployment that the world hasn't seen since was it the, the, the Great Depression. It's even worse now. So if you look at what's in the markets, it's fine that we are digital. But in the markets, we'll be dealing with people who have no money, people who have no way of providing for their family. I think we will see um, social unrest. Uh, I think we will see um, a lot of people forced to, to go into the gig economy simply because they cannot get any jobs. So they have to do this. The, the old terminology was, was, was day workers, right? So, so if, if, you, if you're catering to markets, you should, should consider a large share of your customers today will be out of job, will be in, in a completely different situation tomorrow and a very serious situation. And, and I think one of the things that uh, we all should do now 
is, is to look into how do we need to, to rescale ourselves? How do we need to re-educate ourselves so we can actually survive in the new economy? Because a lot of yeah. us, we are having skills we've been using for 20, 25 years. We now we no, no need really to advance because it's been going well so far. But right now, the world has switched to digital. And we are used to using the, the, the media for digital. But are we capable of working with digital? I don't think many of us are. So, so there's a huge demand for reskilling of people in order to survive in the new world. And, and I think we need to take that point of view into consideration when we look at what's going to happen with the future consumer. Mustafa, one mm -hmm. final no, you're question. No, right. On, um, we, we just, we've got a couple of minutes left. Mustafa, just a final word, if you don't mind, oh, yeah. on the thing about the reskilling of people. Um, what's your view on the biggest change coming out from a post-COVID world? Right, so, so what, what, what I understand here is that uh, the way we as com companies are going to have to sort of adapt and evolve to, 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 to the changing landscape is instead of uh, not just looking at a problem that, uh, that, uh, that, that are coming about, but also trying to understand the consumer needs and behaviors, right? And, and this is something that, you know, I, I uh, you know, preach and practice at Lock Sago, and that is going out and about and conducting research. Uh, you know, on, on a regular basis of understanding how the shifts in behaviors are happening because because um, I know there's a question floating about on, you know, well, what kind of technology should, uh, should, uh, should you be using here is um, it's, not, it's not easy to say what's the next big, big technology, whether you should go for a chatbot, whether it's AR, VR, and so on, right? It's really honing down on what that customer need is and then technology being the how and how to sort of solve that problem. Now, it could be as simple as, you know, uh, you know things like, Skype has been in this game for like ages, right? They, they, had, they were 13 years early to the party, but now they just use as, as a verb, like, hey, let me Skype you. Sure, I'll send you the Zoom link, right? Uh, so they, they've been there as a technology, but it's, 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 only, it's only a company as Zoom that has then really understood where, where, the, where the pain points were and the actual need was and created this fun brand around it that made it easier for, you know, non-techies to also hop on the bandwagon and have a seamless experience and not, you know, be left in isolation. So at the end of the day, it's we we as you know uh, companies need to uh, uh, understand what those consumer needs are and how they're really changing instead of just focusing on a broad, broad problem, right? Because a problem could lead to multiple different ways of uh, tackling it. You may hit the target, you may not, right? Thinking that you know you've got the problem, but actually going out there and speaking to customers, which now, if you ask me, is a lot more easier with Zoom. You know, uh, you know, tapping into a pool of uh, of a general population through social media, and uh, and uh, having se setting up these sort of one on one one sessions with these customers, finding out from them what's going on, and then devising a plan that okay, this is a common real uh, underlying pain point that doesn't really float to the surface unless you do this type of research. And and now we look at what technologies exist, what's upcoming, what's new, what you know fintechs are out there that are that are offering these sort of services and tap into those guys to, to, to bring in that technology or build that technology within your organization to sort of combat that uh, problem. So that's kind of how I see uh, things changing in a post-COVID world where, we're, where we as organizations are gonna have to heavily depend on sort of this type of co uh, consumer research and not just go about the overall big problem because we're just then you know, groping in the dark if, if we're gonna try to solve that major problem without really pinpointing it. Uh, to the real uh, pain points. To add to what Mustafa is saying, that uh, now customer engagement would become more, more and more profound and more, and more legitimate because now you, if you don't know the real time of the real time needs of the customers, I mean you will be left out, left out, and and that would be something you should be more focused on. Real time thing would be more because now customers are like Navid also said that that people are now going to go for essentials first. Uh, he pointed out in the retail part that yeah, essentials would be the key. Now, if you're wearing a Rado or a, uh, or any other simple watch, would not make a difference because that times were gone wherein you used to flash out your uh, expensive watches and your phones. Now it's the basic essentials which is important, and now you need to get more engaged with your customers through various touch points the customers are having, whether Zoom, phone. I mean, wherever the customer is available, you need to get in there and get engaged, learn their real time needs. Like, uh, I mean, if someone is looking out for money, is there a bank who can give them money for short term? 
I mean, someone who is going for uh, education abroad and wants an immediate student loan, is there a bank around considering all the real time needs offer that kind of a loan? So, I mean, more of a real time needs would be more important and profound and legitimate than waiting for creating a customer database, segmenting it, dissecting it, uh, doing a surgery or doing a diagnostic of it. Uh, it's not going to help. You need to get, build platforms. You need to build the methods. You need to build a ways, different ways of doing business. I mean, right. you should be there right in front of their customer or prospective customers all the time. That's great. And sure, thank you very much indeed. Um, I would just like to take the opportunity to thank all of the panelists for today's contributions. It's uh, very much appreciated and thank you for your insights and your time. Thank you to all of our attendees for joining. Micah, I'm going to hand back over to yourself to finish off. Thank you. Hey everyone. Yes, obviously, thank you to all our panelists and Ross for that insightful session. It's great to hear different opinions from different industries. I hope the speakers enjoyed it and all the um, attendees also enjoyed that discussion. Um, so yes, that's the end of our webinar today. Thank you all for joining. Um, the webinar will be available for on-demand viewing. Um, obviously, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to get in touch with us via our website. Um, our next webinar will will be on Wednesday, 3rd of June at 11 a.m., where we will discuss reimagining loyalty and rewards. Again, thank you to the speakers and all the attendees, and we hope to see you next month. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks. You. Take Ross. care. Thanks, Rick.